back at it again with the Mobius Dickus Chapter 36, the quarter deck. Ooh, this is a good one. Okay, you'll see that right off the bat, I've marked the first parenthetical citation or whatever you want to call it in blue because we just shifted genres. That is stage direction for a play. Like, wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. what is going on? This is experimental for a book even if we were in 2020, the fact that in 1851, Melville is shifting genres within a novel is so bonkers that it's kind of hard to explain. It would, the only way I can kind of relate it, I think, is the notion of if you were watching something on Netflix and then 45 minutes in, it just started putting a text scroll and you just started reading a book on the screen. Like the genre of drama and novel was so separate in 1851 that to smash them together like this with no warning, with no preface, with no like, hey, reader, I know this is going to get weird, but stick with me. Crazy, crazy. But I'm not going to harp on the, the you know, English majory shift in genre stuff for too long because we got too much good stuff to go over in chapter 36 because we get the introduction of Captain Ahab saying, hey, I'm in this game for Moby Dick. Are you guys? And so he gives this big, big passage about why he wants to chase Moby Dick. So I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to give you uh, a breakdown of everything that's in here. So let's start. Hark ye yet again, the little lower layer. All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall, shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's not beyond. But tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength, with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate, and be the white whale agent, or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man, I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that, then could I do the other. Since there is ever a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creations, but not my master man is even that fair play. Who's over me? Truth has no confines. Oh man, this is, this is, you know, this is 100 mile an hour fastball stuff coming out from Melville. You love to see it as a literature fan. So I guess I should go over literal meaning and then we'll think about how it goes into context with uh, Captain Ahab. So the first thing that Ahab says is that everything you see in life are metaphorically masks. And in that sense, it looks like the world doesn't reason, but the world, he says, does reason. So let me explain. He's saying that it seems like there is no intentionality behind the fact that, I don't know, uh, let's say a rock falls off a cliff and crushes a person. We tend to think that that's simply the mechanical interaction of gravitational pull the rock was not malicious. Why would we attribute any wrong to the rock? Same thing one could read as an explanation for Moby Dick eating Captain Ahab's leg. It's just an unthinking whale. It's just governed by mechanical laws. It doesn't have any spirit or any inspiration behind it. You could even, if you wanted to go far with your mechanical thinking, apply this to human beings. You could say, Actually, human beings don't make any choices. We're simply programmed by our brain chemistry to seek out things which are evolutionarily advantageous, etc., etc., etc. Ahab's not buying that, okay? Ahab is not buying that we can just say that there is no more to life than meets the eye, that there is no reason guiding the seemingly random acts of life. He is completely rejecting a kind of fatalism about why things happen. He says, in fact, that... The fact that it looks like things just happen randomly is simply a mask. And on the other side of that unreasoning mask, there is something that reasons. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what could be on the other side of that reasoning? Uh, well, maybe it's God, right? Maybe God sent Moby Dick to punish Ahab in some way. Maybe it's... Uh, some other life force that you can't know. Maybe it's other people actually having their own thoughts and uh, thoughts and emotions, 
like whales maybe have thoughts and emotions just like human beings have them and this is a personal feud between him and the whale it's something that's very difficult to know right hence why it's in yellow but ahab's attitude to how one should treat the world in terms of it being empty or full of meaning and of intentionality is that you have to treat the world as having purpose and having meaning that meaning is lying behind what looks like a meaningless exterior okay so if a man will strike strike through the mask how can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall so here the prisoner would be the belief that the world is empty that there is not meaning and purpose endowed into things that things don't happen for a reason if things don't happen for a reason, now think of Slaughterhouse Five, right, guys? If you're a fatalist, you say that things don't happen for a reason; they simply happen the way they happen, right? Vi you, vi anybody. Blobs of amber, all that good stuff. To Ahab, that view is to view yourself as a prisoner, and if you want to break out of that mindset, well, then you're going to have to reach outside of that mindset and see in your attitude towards choice that. Whatever happens to you is the product of something that is intentional. It's the product of somewhere, somehow choice, be it God's divine choice for you or simply the product of human choices that affect you. Nevertheless, it is not simply a blank wall. There's something behind it. So you're a prisoner if you believe in the wall and you have to thrust through the wall. And to Captain Ahab, Moby Dick represents that notion that he refuses to think that this guy is just a whale. He refuses to admit that perhaps that whale just bit his leg off because that's what whales are programmed to do and it wasn't a choice. He has to see this thing that happens to him, this event in the world, as full of meaning. Hence, to me, the white whale is that wall, shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's nothing beyond. So Ahab admits, it's obviously anyone who's smart has to think to themselves, Wait, do things really happen for a purpose? Is there really something guiding events? Or do the laws of chance and fate really dictate everything? And my choice doesn't really matter that much. But tis enough. He, Moby Dick, tasks me. He heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. Okay. If there is any famous phrase in this book, it's inscrutable malice. Because that phrase describes the kind of fullness of intentionality that Ahab argues one should see in life. It, it captures that sense of seeing the world and the things that happen to you as being the product of choice, right? If someone chooses something, then we could say they had malice. If they don't choose it, there's no intention, right? The intention to do evil. Hence why we say murder can be committed with malice if there was intent to murder someone, but we would never say there's any such thing as malicious manslaughter because you can't intend to commit manslaughter. So do you think that the things that happen to you are the product of the intention of either God or other people, or do you think that the actions of the world are empty and simply the pr products of fate and causality? To Ahab, Moby Dick represents this inscrutable malice of the world. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. And be the white whale agent or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. This is a great line that could be confusing. Okay, Agent means that you work for someone. You act on behalf of another. Principal means you are first in order of importance. So what is Ahab saying? If the world is full of meaning, if the world, if what happens to you is the product of choice, it's totally possible that the that Moby Dick is simply the agent of God, that it's God making the decisions, punishing Ahab for some reason, or it's totally possible that the white whale is itself making choices to try to hate Ahab, that it's smarter than we think and it acts with an intentionality that we usually wouldn't ascribe to an animal. But either way, what those two have in common is the notion that what happens to Ahab is the product of intention, not of fate. I will wreak that hate upon him. So what is the implication here? That if the white whale is an agent of God, then Ahab is still willing to hate him, right? Ahab is willing to exert his, in his mind, his access to choice even in the face of God punishing him. So this would metaphorically be equivalent to saying like, God, I know that 
Your choice and your decision is that thou shalt not murder, but my choice and my decision is that I really want to murder. So screw you, I'm going to do what I want. Hence why he says, talk not to me of blasphemy, man, because he knows that his admitting that he would be willing to contradict the intentionality, the malice of God would be blasphemous. He says, I'd strike the son if it insulted me. So Ahab first truly believes that life is only the product of intentionality and choice, not of fate. And then he says, there is no one's choices, even God's, who is, which is more important than mine. For could the son do that, then could I do the other? Since there is ever a sort of fair play heron, jealousy presiding over all creation. So he says, if the son has the ability to strike me with choice, I should have the choice to strike it back. Okay, you can't have an asymmetrical relationship here. You can't have God have choice, but human beings not have choice. But not my master man is even that fair play. Who's over me? Who's over me? So ironically, even though it, Ahab is saying that he believes in the intentionality of the world, he's saying, yeah, I believe that things happen for a reason, but God's reasons are no better than my reasons if he exists. And if, and if Moby Dick has reasons, he's not just acting as a tool of God, then Moby Dick's reasons are not better than my reasons. Hence his final statement, truth hath no confines. If it is true that the world is the product of choice, then you can't confine or limit that. You have to let people make the decisions that they want to make because that's what makes the world uh, truly go round. So uh, I think I've explained the choice, pasteboard mask, intentionality, inscrutable malice question here. But if if we were going to do a psychological uh, examination here, we might say that this is due to any variety of psychological factors that motivate Ahab. You could say that all he wants is uh, revenge for the fact that this stupid beast took off his leg and so he's decided that he's going to kill him out of revenge, which is not a philosophical statement like we've been, we've been talking about. So let's be clear. I'm grouping my previous explanation into philosophical reasoning. Now we're doing psychological reasoning. Psychological reasoning one would be revenge. Psychological reasoning, too, would be like challenge, that perhaps this wall that has been shoved near to Ahab is like a challenge of can he even conquer the white whale, right? Does he have the ability to catch it? Uh, perhaps it's simply the mystery of the white whale, right? Like he's entranced by how hard it is to understand the white whale. Perhaps it's psychologically a matter of pride, like when Ahab says, I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. Maybe he wants to kill the white whale because he can't psychologically handle the hit to his pride of being bested by an animal. Maybe it's an ultimate assertion of ego. Who's over me? Who's more important than me? Maybe this whole task is not about philosophy. It's simply about Ahab trying to exude his own ego. And then I would say the search for truth is that first explanation I gave that's philosophical. Perhaps he is pursuing the question of whether the world is full of choice and intentionality and whether the emptiness of the world is simply a mask that we should strike through. And then, of course, we have the final possibility, which is that, you know, Moby Dick is just a whale and there's nothing important about Moby Dick at all. But how could you ever know? How could you know whether Moby Dick truly has inscrutable malice or whether the pasteboard mask is an illusion and we need to strike through it. It is an impossible question to answer, but certainly A, this paragraph forces the reader to examine that question and B, gives insight into Ahab's philosophical attitude towards answering that question. Okay, classic, classic passage that is so chock full of interesting stuff in terms of imagery and ways of explaining those ideas. Uh, chapter 36 is one of the most well-cited and well-known passages. I hope you have a pretty clear understanding of the multiple layers it contains, and uh, I'll see you in the next video.